Good morning and welcome everyone to our lecture today on BC212, our course on Christian apologetics. We, um, I'm actually pre-recording this uh, lecture because I'm going to be traveling this week. So this is a pre-recorded lecture. Uh, I thought I'll uh, record one lesson, one lecture, and then give you something to work on in the second lecture. Uh, I'm traveling this week, um, Wednesday to Saturday, uh, just ministering in, in another city at a conference. So let's just pray together before we get started. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to connect online, and uh, we thank you for everyone who are listening to this lecture or going to listen to this lecture. We just pray that, Father, that understanding and knowledge and revelation be imparted to our hearts and maybe be drawn closer to you. Maybe be drawn closer to your heart, Father, even as we study and consider these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we are getting into lesson number 15. So uh, you could follow along on the PDF and I have this also open here. And um, you could, um, uh, lesson number 15, we're going to spend some time talking about biblical understanding of suffering. So we are going to really uh, and try and under, uh, address uh, this important question about questions about suffering. Um, why is there suffering? And, you know, the common question that people ask is, if there is a good God, if God really cares about us, if God created everything, why is there so much sin and so much suffering in this world? What is God doing? Why isn't he just stepping in and sorting everything out and making everything good? Why does God allow so many things to continue on the earth? And uh, what purpose does this serve? Uh, and, you know, uh, to add to the complexity of these questions, uh, some people may even ask, why do good people suffer bad things? Why do believers, people who love God, why do they suffer bad things? And so uh, uh, things can get really, really intense, or really complex as we think about suffering uh, itself. So we're going to do our best to give us a framework, a perspective, on how to think about suffering and how we can address uh, the questions that might come to us. Now, uh, the things that we're going to learn, obviously, is not something we can speak to everybody. You know, it does require people who are willing to look into the scriptures and look at things from a biblical perspective. Uh, if that uh, is not there, it's not going to be easy for us to explain all of these things uh, to, to somebody who may not necessarily agree with what the scriptures teach us. But let's do our best and let's, let us be clear on the basis of scripture why suffering happens. Now, some of the things that we're going to be looking at is we're going to... Uh, uh, address some areas. We are, we're going to understand uh, God's heart uh, in the light of his original intent. We're going to look at that. Uh, we're going to look at um, the fact that suffering is a present reality. Uh, and we're going to then examine, you know, different reasons for suffering. What are some biblical reasons or from the Bible? What can we understand? And so we'll outline several of those reasons and then get into some other questions and why do believers suffer and what should our mindset be uh, when we face suffering and towards persecution as well. So it's quite a lot of ground that we want to cover. We'll, we'll cover some ground today and then we'll continue this next week. Now, first and the most important thing for us is to understand the heart of God in the light of his original intent. That means, let's look at what was God's original intent, and therefore that will tell us the heart of God. Now, what is God's heart? 
That's what we want to come. That's where we want to come from, rather than uh, assuming things based on what our experiences tells us and what we are observing around us. We need to try to understand the heart of God. So let's look at the original intent, or when God first created everything. How were things? Genesis one and verse thirty-one tells us that when God created everything, it was all good. There was no sin. There was no suffering. There was no pain. There was no sickness. There was no wickedness. It was all good. And we also see in Genesis two nine that in the garden where God had placed man, there was a tree of life. And He told man, "You can partake of the tree of life. You can eat of the tree of life." Now, what is the tree of life? In the Look in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 to 4, also Revelation 22, verse 3. We see that the tree of life, the leaves of the tree of life are for the healing of the nations. That means uh, it doesn't mean that there's going to be sickness and therefore they need to be healed, but rather it means that uh, the tree of life is going to help keep people and it's going to help sustain life, strength, wholeness. And that's what it symbolizes, and that's what it's that's the purpose it serves. So, in an environment where everything was perfect, that means there was no sickness, there was no pain, God placed the tree of life. And the purpose was to keep everything good, strong, healthy, whole. And so, God said, You can partake of this tree. And in some way, it served that purpose. But I think more importantly, it speaks to us of the fact that in a, an environment that was perfect, God had a way by which he would sustain that perfection, that wholeness, that health, that life, that, 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 uh, that the place where there was no sickness and pain. So it is safe for us to conclude, and obviously we conclude that suffering, pain, sorrow, tears, anguish, these were not part of God's original design. It wasn't there in the Garden of Eden and you don't see it also in Revelation when there are new heavens and the new earth. You don't see it. So it is not part of God's original intent for man, and neither is it going to be something that man is going to continue on uh, uh, forever. No, in new heavens and new earth, it's going to be a place where there'll be no more suffering, pain, sorrow, tears, or anguish. And so forth. Therefore, we can understand the heart of God. What is the heart of God? That God does not want his people to suffer. That is not the will of God. That is not the intent of God. If God wanted suffering to be a part of our experience, he would have put it right there in the Garden of Eden before the fall. And if God thinks suffering is good for us, then he would definitely put it in, in the new heavens and the new earth. But it's not there in the garden, and neither is it the new heavens and the new earth. So that is not God's will for us. Suffering and pain and sorrow and tears is not part of God's intent for us. It's not something he considers as good for us. We can state that with absolute confidence. So we must be careful today as we are journeying in between the perfection in which things began and the perfection in which things will become. We are in between that. As we journey now through, the, uh, through this imperfect world that there is pain, there is suffering, we should be careful that we do not accuse God for our pain and suffering. We must not accuse God for our pain and suffering. That's something we must not do. So, how did suffering come in? Now, we obviously are very aware of the fall of man. We know that Adam and Eve had no knowledge of evil. Uh, they did not have any predisposition to sin or to do evil, to harm, to hurt. They didn't have any of that. Lucifer had fallen. He had been cast out of heaven. And he was looking for a place of entry into the earth. 
the earth was given to man. Psalm 115 verse 16. Man was in charge. Man was put in dominion on the earth. And Lucifer was trying to gain entrance here. And he was trying to gain control of the earth. And we know what happened. He came in. He deceived Adam and Eve. And he got them to disobey God. And through one man's disobedience, sin entered the world. And through sin, death gained entrance. So Romans 5, verse 12, for by one man, sin came in into this world. And death passed on all men, for all have sinned. So one man's disobedience brought sin into this world and it brought death into this world. Now remember, neither sin nor everything that followed it, all kinds of evil, none of these were part of God's original intent. They were not part of God's original intent. So it came in because of Adam's disobedience, of the sin or the fall of man. So we must keep that in mind that sin and all of its consequences, everything we are experiencing here today is not part of God's design, original design. Neither is it part of God's original intent. It's not part of his desire for you and me. It's not what God wanted for us. So we can we know from scripture jeremiah 20 chapter 9 verse 20 to 24 that it is god who executes loving kindness justice and righteousness so this god it's not god who's executing evil but god works loving kindness justice and righteousness on the earth now of course because of sin God has to judge sin. God is a holy God. He's a just God. And he has to judge sin. But even in that, we can see the righteousness and the mercy of God, grace and truth being executed. Right? Now, as we think about suffering, having understood that background, it is also recognized that uh, suffering is a present reality. So we can't deny it. We can't say, oh, there's no suffering. Or neither can we say for a believer, there will be no suffering. No, even believers face suffering. Jesus said in John 16, 33, speaking to his own disciples, he said, in the world, you will have tribulation. He's talking about himself. He says, in me, you will have peace. But in the world, you will have tribulation. That means so as believers, we know that in Christ we can have peace, but we still have to live in this world. And in this world, there is going to be all of these suffering and pain and pressures and sin and hardship and persecution. All those things will be happening. So we are in Christ, and yet we are in this world. And so we are going to face these things. And he said, be of good cheer, because I have overcome the world. He has overcome these things. And so therefore, we can walk with good cheer, we can walk with that sense of joy, confidence, assurance, even though there is suffering all around us. Now, uh, we are aware that there, we experience suffering in all three realms. So there is spiritual, there is emotional, there is physical. Um, people can suffer spiritually, uh, which sometimes is due to in satanic oppression, bondage to sin, and so on. People can suffer emotionally, which is a trouble in the area of the mind, the emotions, you know, oppression, depression, all kinds of things, and physically. And all of these three are tightly coupled. So um, oftentimes suffering in one area affects the other areas and, and so on. So they're all interconnected. So the fact is we experience suffering in all three realms, right? So it's not like uh, we will never face uh, challenges in any of these areas. We will face challenges in all these areas and we need to learn how to face them, overcome them and still live victorious in the midst of all of these things. So 
what are some of the reasons for suffering? And we're going to look at um, six of these reasons uh, in this lesson. We might just touch upon one or two of these uh, in this lecture. But uh, we'll just outline these six reasons and then we get into them as we progress. So the first reason we are going to look at is suffering due to the bondage of corruption. We'll explain what that means, and we find this in Romans chapter 8. Second reason why they could be suffering is because of one's own actions. People do wrong things, and they face the consequences of their own actions. They can be suffering due to satanic oppression. So there is a devil who attacks, who torments, who uh, trespasses, and who does evil things. He's a thief who, steals, who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Uh, number four, there is a suffering due to other people's actions. So sometimes some people suffer because of the actions of other people. So our actions are intertwined many times and what some people do affects others. And so they're suffering because of that. There's suffering due to divine judgment when God judges our wrongdoing. We reap of what we have sown, we suffer. And they're suffering due to willing sacrifice. So some people are willing, make willing sacrifice, and that sacrifice causes them to face suffering and your challenges. And so that's another sixth reason we're going to look at. So let's go into each of these uh, one by one in a little greater detail. Number one, suffering due to the bondage of corruption. For this, we're going to turn on our Bibles to Romans, the eighth chapter, uh, verses 17 to 23. Romans 8, 17 to 23. The Apostle Paul says here, and if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and joint as with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was not subject to futility. For the, for the creation was subject, sorry, verse 20. For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. So what is the Apostle Paul telling us here in Romans chapter 8, verses 17 to 23? He's saying, you know, he says, look, we are heirs of God, we are joint heirs with Christ. So God has done such an amazing thing where he would place us in this precious position of being heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. So we have such a wonderful place in Christ. And yet immediately he reminds us that though we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, we are royalty, yet we suffer with him. And that's the earthly part. That means here on earth, as we journey through this life, we are going to suffer. We're going to face hardships and all the other things that, that, that are around us. And then he begins to explain something to us. He tells us in verse 18, he says, yeah, you know, we are heirs of God, we're joint heirs with Christ, yet we're going to suffer. And yet the sufferings that we face here on earth, uh, it pales in comparison to the glory that we are going to experience, that we are going to enjoy as heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And 
verse 19, he says, creation, all of creation is, is, is eagerly waiting and has an earnest expectation. That means creation is longing for, is looking forward to something. And is looking forward to the revealing of the sons of God. It's looking forward to this time when the sons of God, we who are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ will come forth, will be manifested, will be revealed. So creation is looking forward for that time. Even creation is anticipating or eagerly looking forward to that time. But what is happening right now? Verse 20. And why is creation looking forward to that? Verse 20. Creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him was subjected in hope. That means all of creation was put in subjection to futility. It was put in subjection to this present state of uh, what seems so futile, what seems so empty, what seems so painful. All of creation was subjected to this. It, it, God let it go. And God allowed creation to become subject to what we are seeing right now. And God did it not willingly. I mean, that was not the plan of God. That was not the will or the intent of God. We, but he let it go because he had a hope. He had a future. He knew that in the future, this would be reversed. Creation will be brought out of this place of being in subjection to all of this vanity and the futility that we see around us. Verse 21, because the creation itself will be delivered from the bondage of corruption. That means there's coming a time when creation will be delivered, will be brought out of this bondage of corruption. That means the right at present, all of creation is in a state where it is subjected to futility or verse 21, it is in bondage to corruption. The word corruption means decay. It's a deviation from God's original design. So today creation is in a state of decay. It has deviated from the original design of God. So when, when, when God created everything, it was perfect. Uh, uh, everything was perfect. Our bodies were never created to get old and die. That was not the way it was created. But today we know that our bodies do get old. They wear out and they die. They decay. Why? Because all of creation was subjected to futility. All of creation is under the bondage of corruption. So everything around us is in a corrupted state, meaning it's gone away from its original design. So, and God subjected it, means God let it go, not willingly, it was not part of his original plan, but he let it go. So when we think of why is there suffering, this is something very important for us to understand that all of creation has been in a state of decline and it's been deviating from its original state of perfection, the order in which God created it. And for example, God did not create this earth to have earthquakes and tsunamis and pandemics and you know uh, catastrophic weather conditions that are so destructive god didn't create the earth like that but the reason we are seeing all that happening is because all of these things are an expression of creation being in bondage to uh, corruption creation has deviated from its original design, and therefore all these things are happening. So why are people born, bodies are born deformed, or uh, babies you know, are born with birth defects, and so many other things that we, we think of and say, how could these things be happening? How could God be creating, I mean, doing these things? No, God is not doing these things. 
these are the result. These things that we're seeing happening are the result of creation being in subject to corruption or being in bondage to corruption. It has deviated from its original design. And so we are seeing all of these things happening. Therefore, we must not blame God. So God created that person like that, or God sent the tsunami, or God sent the earthquake, or God sent, you know, that very destructive thing that killed thousands of people. No, 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 God didn't do it. These weather conditions or other things that we see happening are because all of creation is subject, is in bondage to corruption. The good news is that God will reverse this. As, as Paul writes here, um, the cre creation will be delivered from the bondage of corruption. Creation will be brought out, will be set free from its present state of being in bondage to corruption. There is going to be new heavens and a new earth where that creation will not be in subject to corruption. It will not be in subject to futility. So there's going to be that time. And we see that you know, written for us there in Second Peter chapter 3, verse 5 to 14, and also in Revelation 21, verse 1 to 5. So take some time to think about this. This is one reason why there is suffering in this world. Because all of creation came in subjection to decay, to decline, to deviation from its original state of perfection. And this causes the suffering, a lot of the suffering that we see and people experience around us. So think about that. And the next time when we read about an earthquake or a hurricane or a tsunami or a volcanic eruption that's, dis that's so destructive or fires that uh, destroy acres and acres of uh, forests and disrupt life and so on and so forth. We shouldn't look and blame God and say God is doing that. It's not because of God doing that. It's because creation has deviated from its original state of perfection. And this happened because of sin. When Adam sinned, everything here on earth was given over to imperfection. Death, which is a form of decay, set in into everything and God subjected it, not because that was his will, but in hope or with the expectation or with the anticipation that all this will be redeemed and brought into a state of perfection. So I'm going to pause here um, for, for today and uh, uh, of course the second one will we'll, we'll pick up from point number two next week. But I want what I want to do want, want you to do after the break, uh, after this class, first lecture break, is I want you to spend some time looking at Romans 8, 17 to 23 very carefully. And also, please read through the entire passage of starting from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. And you read right through to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5. And study these, two, um, these portions of scripture and think about, think about what is it telling us about the world in which we currently are, that is the world after the fall. What is it telling us about that? And what is, all, what is it also telling us about the way things are going to be, right? Now, some of these things we've already spoken of, but I want you to just study these two passages in the next lecture hour and think about these two things. What, is the, what do these passages tell us about the world in which we are currently and what does it tell us second what does it tell us about the way things are going to be okay 
So if you want to, you can just write it down or if you want just you can ponder about it and meditate on it. Now, I want to just share a thought here and then we'll close. The reason God has anointed, one of the reasons why God has anointed us with the power of the Holy Spirit and given us the authority of the name of Jesus today is that through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can undo some of the effects of the bondage of corruption. What does that mean? You think about the Lord Jesus and his ministry. Think about the man in John chapter 9 who was born blind. Now, why was he born blind? Jesus you know, said it's not his, his sin or his parents' sin. Why was he born blind? God didn't make him that way. The reason he was born blind is because of the bondage of corruption, meaning uh, everything in creation is deviated from its original design. And so there are some who are born blind. That's a defect. It's a deviation from original design. But what did Jesus do in that situation? He said, we must work the works of God. We must do what God would do. And what did God do? He undid the effect of this bondage of corruption. He restored sight to this blind man. And so I want you to keep this thought in mind that you and I today as believers are anointed by the Holy Spirit to bring relief to the effects of the bondage of corruption. I'm not saying we're going to solve everything, but like Jesus, how he ministered to certain individuals, he ministered to people, he healed them, he restored sight, he made the maimed whole, he made the lame to walk. Uh, those who were born lame, he made them walk and deaf and dumb, he healed them. He was by the power of God reversing the effects of the bondage of corruption. And so you and I can do the same thing. That by the power of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we reverse the effects of the bondage of corruption as we minister healing to people. And the power of God can do it. And so when we see these things, by the power of God, and through faith in God, and through the authority given to us in the name of Jesus, we confront these effects of the bondage of corruption and we can undo it uh, and, and deal with it. So when you, when you saw Jesus going on the boat and there was this storm coming, who sent the storm? Did God the Father send the storm? and said, okay, let me check my son out and cause a storm on the sea. No. Why was there a storm in the sea? What, what, did, did God create that? No. It is a result of what we call creation being in subjection to corruption. It's, it's deviated from its original design. And so here comes the sea that, the storm and the sea that, that could potentially destroy lives. What did Jesus do? Through faith in God, he countered that. He said, peace be still. The winds, the waves calm down. He turned to his disciples and he said, where is your faith? So that's what we need. Our faith in God and the power of God will reverse the effects of bondage of corruption uh, wherever we confront it uh, and as the Lord leads us to work against it, right? So think about that and uh, let's wrap up. Thank you for your listening. Thank you for your patient listening. Let's uh, pray and close. And the next lecture hour, I uh, request you to um, think through on these two passages that we just mentioned. Let's pray and then we'll close. Father, we thank you for this time of learning, uh, for the insights that we were able to gain. And we pray that you give us understanding and help us, Lord, to grasp these things and then meaningfully serve people and serve you and glorify you. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, everyone. God bless. Enjoy the rest of your day.